You are listening to the instructional narrative, which includes instruction. <laughs> to turn this off, simply press the audio button on your DVD remote and keep pressing it until you hear just the sounds of the ride. There won't be any narrative or music or anything. Syncing up. Ouch. End credits now. Oh, welcome to Heart Health Volume 1. This is the uh, Autumn Trails through Denver, Colorado. This is a little different format than what I'm used to. This is a nice bare bones raw footage that's been processed to have uh, real nice video quality and smooth image no shaking um, but we're going without the uh, overlays the training tools as a heart health workout what we're looking to encourage is simply riding our bikes and maintaining a nice easy rhythm, uh, keeping the heart rate in zone one, zone two. We shouldn't exceed 75% of max throughout this entire video. So this is a real nice uh, recovery ride. It's a great ride to get us started on a fitness routine. Just smash pumping in there and uh, this ride is going to really emulate the one that uh, we were actually on right here just rolling out of the neighborhood we're in Aurora Colorado this is the southern southeastern part of the metro Denver metro area and we're gonna follow this trail um, I think it's called the Piney Creek Trail uh, and we're going to follow this all the way until we hit the Cherry Creek Trail. And the Cherry Creek Trail will pretty much take us all the way into Denver, Colorado. But we'll take a, a couple of uh, diversions from the trail. And uh, we're going to go through Washington Park, which is a really beautiful park in Denver, Colorado. Pretty famous, actually. We'll be going through uh, Cherry Creek State Park as well. Get some uh, views of the, the lakes out here and, and what uh, Denver has to offer other than subdivisions. <laughs> now we're in the suburbs. And we'll be heading mostly uh, northwest. And we're starting at about 62, 6,300 feet and descending down to 5,280 when we hit uh, the Platte River be right at a mile so beautiful autumn day we're only about a week maybe less from Halloween And it was just too pretty to pass up. I fired up the camera and took a ride down the trail here. This is a really nice trail to just take it easy, enjoy the scenery. Uh, some people like to race on these, but I'm not a big fan of going too fast on these things. Especially when we get to Cherry Creek Trail, it's crazy busy, usually. Uh, we're riding on a Friday, so everybody's still at work. But on the weekends, the trails are just packed with people, and you got to be careful. So we're in our easiest gear here, a 1 out of 10 on resistance. Just soft pedaling, 
cadence about 80 RPM. Let our heart rate oh, get into uh, zone 1 between 60 to 70 percent of our max. We'll pretty much just stick it there. We want to stay in zone 1, maybe jump into zone 2 a couple of times, but this is not a workout for testing our strength or our discipline. This is a, a recovery ride only. I got this uh, video categorized under heart health. And what I'm trying to do here is encourage new cyclists to begin developing their fitness, their skills, with a, a nice, easy, fun ride with some information on cycling and preparing to make some uh, life changes to adopt the sport into your own persona. And I don't want to stress anybody out here by telling them to <laughs> blow it through the roof. I want to have fun. Just a nice fun ride. And the trails are kind of wiggly and windy and, and it's pretty, so get some neat uh, sensation of movement and twisting and turning and it's just a uh, kind of puts you into the into the ride so a little while ago I was uh, approached by an advisor to come up with a vision statement for my emerging company cycling videos online and I thought, huh, what is my vision? I had really no idea. I wasn't really approaching it from a real business standpoint. Somebody said I should probably take it a little more seriously. And, and I think they're right. <laughs> so I started thinking, what is my vision? What is my vision statement for the company? And to make great videos? Eh maybe <laughs> to encourage health and fitness oh that's good uh, to spread the joy of cycling yeah I like cycling it's a great sport it's fun but none of those really seem to target the vision of cycling vid videos online then I recalled a conversation I had with a client of mine He contacted me because uh, he needed to lose weight on the advice of his doctor. And he had just purchased a brand new spin bike and was working out 60 minutes a day but wasn't getting the results that he wanted. So I made the assumption that he was stepping on a scale every day and then stepping off and shaking his head. And then he wrote me looking for some solutions. And basically, you know, my response was that well, first, stepping on a scale every day and monitoring your weight is like watching water boil. Um, if you're just starting out, I'd advise, recommend anybody just doing this, just do it once a month. You need to be rewarded by your efforts. And the weight can fluctuate from a day to day, and sometimes you're going up, and other times you're going down, and it's like, it's really demotivating. So every month, you should see some positive changes. So do that and graph it. Also, weight loss is a side effect of cycling. Um, I, I wouldn't consider it to be the focus of it. Cycling is fun first. So have fun, feel good, 
and weight loss should come as a result of that of just having a good time getting out going for a ride you know and you're not really thinking about losing weight but all of a sudden there you go dropping some weight feeling healthier and it shouldn't be on the forefront of your consciousness just uh, get on your bike and ride and weight loss will only occur after you become proficient with the activity so when you get stronger that's when you actually start burning fat so in the early stages I wouldn't even really look at this as a goal you get good at the sport first have fun then get good at it and then you'll start noticing some positive progression pretty quickly as a matter of fact you know the thing to think about is that you know burning fat takes a long time uh, fat is a efficient means of storing energy and it works like a duraflame log a little bit burns a long time so you need to stay active for a long time to burn fat 60 minutes on a trainer and the rest of the day in front of the TV will not accomplish rapid weight loss or maybe won't even accomplish any for that matter so I suggest a long time on the trainer if you're gonna start wanting to lose weight an hour and a half or more three times a week and 30 minutes a day at least 30 minutes a day of light activity walking uh, going shopping whatever and the more hours a day that you are active the more fat gets burned so so if you're looking at this from a weight loss standpoint that's my suggestion if you're just starting out I, I wouldn't you know focus on this uh, activity right now as a means to lose weight I'd focus on this as, an, as a means to change your focus to begin putting yourself in a position where you can become proficient and have enough fun with the activity so that weight loss or health will, will be the result. So from from that, uh, basically from that e email, my vision statement uh, is simply to promote a healthy, active lifestyle and making it fun by encouraging the sport of cycling. So have fun, get out and ride, and when uh, fitness is a, a result of that, well then, that's, uh, that's my goal. We're actually entering, we're in the, the Cherry Creek uh, Park right now. It's a pretty big park. There's some uh, mountain biking and shooting ranges and model airplane range. And we're going to turn here onto the Cherry Creek Bike Trail. Now this is a pretty cool trail. It, uh, I mean, we're going to be on it for, oh, 15, 20 miles. And then we're going to turn off it, go to Washington Park, get back on it again, and follow it all the way into downtown Denver into the Platte River. And from here, or actually from the house to Denver, is a solid 25 miles of just trail. But it doesn't end there. I mean, if we were heading uh, the other way backwards, we're going north, uh, 
this trail is uh, goes all the way to well, Parker, Colorado. It's about another six miles or so. And then when we get into Denver, the, this trail will split into a couple of different directions. You can take uh, the uh, Platte River Trail north or south. And you can follow it uh, north for another 10, 15 miles and south for another 15 or so miles. And, and pick up just uh, another set of trails off of those. So what makes uh, Denver so cool is uh, quite an investment in a healthy, active lifestyle out here by putting these trails in and letting people ride for or uninterrupted riding for hours and miles and without seeing a car or having to stop at a stop sign or stoplight. It's a really neat climate out here. And if you're looking to get healthy, it's nice to have a healthy climate that, that you can be in. People that are of like mind and body It's fun uh, here at the uh, park. We can always pick up a ride. Other people cycling, racing, training, whatever. My friend Tim Cody, a guy who helped me with uh, the steamboat video. Him and I uh, pick up the road out here and always push each other. He's faster than I am, <laughs> but I can uh, put up a good front. And then there's a lot of other people out here as well that uh, you can just uh, jump on a ride with and they love having you on board. Somebody else to take a pull. Well, in my history, I've been riding for many years, roughly you know, 20, 25 years. It started when I was 16, but uh, cycling changed my life, uh, not once, but twice. And it's also become a business. So I owe a lot to the sport. Back in high school, I was a depressed young youth. My parents were going through a divorce. I was awkward. I was uh, bullied and picked on in school. I had braces. And I had this uh, thing in my mouth that prevented me from being able to communicate effectively. <laughs> food would get trapped and I tried to say something it shot right out of my mouth so I made a habit of putting my hand in front of my mouth every time I ate or drank anyway <laughs> my confidence uh, suffered as a result of my environment my age and then I found cycling And as I became more proficient at the sport, and I started getting really good, I used to take my bike pretty much everywhere. Commuted my bike to school, it was a good 15 miles each way, every day. A janitor was nice enough to let me lock it up in his closet, because really back then, you know, he had a bike rack outside, but that was for the BMX bikes and Schwinn cruisers. 
it wasn't for a nice uh, lightweight fast race bike that I didn't trust a lock to. Took my bike up to the mountains. Took my bike camping. Made it a part of my life and within a few years, or not even that long, maybe a few months, as I began enjoying the sport and enjoying my life and gained a lot of confidence things really just turned around for me we got a slightly uphill grade here so we can add a little bit extra resistance maybe another click on the trainer put it into a slightly bigger gear not much Resistance right around that, maybe a three or four out of ten. We'll have a our one hill climb coming up. We'll add a little bit of resistance for that. That's pretty much it. So I turned around. Cycling was so important to me, and and I stuck with it for. 10 years, 15 years. Raced. Depression ended. It's good times. And then uh, after a few accidents, I need to admit, I stopped riding a lot and went into the gym and started adding weight, lifting. I did that for about 10 years. And then after I got married, I realized that I wasn't where I wanted to be. I mean, I wanted to be married, but I was gaining weight in the wrong places, losing my health, had a hard time breathing, going upstairs, looked in the mirror, didn't like what I saw, got my wedding photos back, and I said, oh, It was one of those things where you you think you look good because you're positioning yourself in the mirror just right so you don't see the flab. <laughs> and somebody takes a, a picture of you and you're like, huh, okay. So I got married, had a kid, David, and him and I had some time off together. I took care of him for six months and put him in the trailer and started riding around Reno with him. And then I got on my first group ride. Thought I was pretty, pretty in shape. And then I realized that uh, I wasn't as uh, strong as I thought. The group just demolished me. But I stuck with it, and cycling once again became a huge part of my life. Here's our hill here. Let's go ahead and add a little bit of resistance. Do like a seven out of 10. Just keep it in your small ring up front and put it in your biggest or highest resistance gear in the back. Keep our cadence right around 80 RPM. And we'll just raise up the heart rate to about And up at the top here, let's go ahead and just put it in our easy gear again. Resistance of about two, one, a little descent here. And 
Got the beautiful Cherry Creek Lake right in front of us. The mountain range in the distance. This road is really bumpy. So the interesting thing about cycling, in my opinion, is that uh, it quickly evolves from a simple activity into a way of life. And when it becomes a way of life, you can't help but to see changes. Once the sport has consumed you, you begin seeing changes in everything about you. A new outlook on life. A new outlook on your community where you live. When you're going 15 miles an hour, the back suburbs or country roads or paths you see a side of your community that you've never experienced from your car smell the smells feel the air and the wind meet people other cyclists other people who just like being outside You see a new reflection in the mirror, one that shows some weight loss, and it's actually pretty rapid. Within the first year back from cycling, I lost 30 pounds, and I wasn't really trying to lose weight, I was just having a good time. We can add a little resistance here, we got a little gradual ascent. Maybe a 5 out of 10. Keep the cadence up right around 80. 80, 90. We're not going to be spinning the legs super fast. We're not going to be cranking or mashing up any steep climbs. Just rolling along. And we can take that resistance off back down to a 2 two or a three out of ten and of course uh, a decrease in blood pressure lower resting heart rate uh, lots more energy better sleep at night better sex at night you get stronger improve uh, improvement in your posture Clarity of thought, more decisive, and more patience too. Traffic jams just don't bug you as much when you when you're pooped and tired from <laughs> pedaling. It's quite a luxury sitting in your car in traffic after you've been working out and exhausting yourself on your bike. And the list goes on. Let's not forget to drink. Every 10 minutes or so, take a sip. Whether you feel thirsty or not. So riding your trainer indoors for 30 minutes a day really won't do a whole heck of a lot for you. Uh, the physical activity is only a small portion of what needs to be done to help improve your health. And it really begins with the way that you think and how you approach this activity. It starts in your head first. And then it'll work down to your body. You 
know, 30 minutes a day is a nice start. That's what the American Heart Association recommends as a minimum activity for a day. 30 minutes a day of light activity, three times a week, and 30 minutes twice a week, or two times a week of higher efforts, like a jog or climbing up the stairs, that type of effort. But that's a minimum. And we're not about maintaining a minimum. But it's a good start. Approaching the activity and changing your mindset I think starts in one place. Getting the uniform of a cyclist. You know, if you've ever come to work in your sweats and t-shirt, it's kind of like one of those days where like, yeah, I'm not really working, I'm not here today. Don't talk to me. <laughs> do what you need to do and get out. But when you're ready to work, you wear your uniform, whether it's a suit or a specific outfit. Same thing with cycling. If you're in uh, sweats and a t-shirt and a pair of tennis shoes, I would encourage you to very quickly make a change and get the uniform of a cyclist, whether you feel you deserve it or not. And that uniform includes obviously the, the bicycle, also includes cycling shoes, the cycling lycra, or the stretchy spandex, shirt, bottoms, padded leather gloves, heart rate monitor, and a helmet. Now I don't see the the outfit, the gloves and the lycra and the and the shirt as a a means to be flashy or noticeable. It has a specific function and a specific purpose. And most importantly, when I put it on, I know it's time to ride. I know it's time to work. And the way I feel when I'm riding in my blue jeans compared to when I'm geared up and suited for a ride is night and day. We can add a little resistance here. It's a little teeny hill. Maybe a 5 out of 10. And the purpose of this uh, narrative is not to explain all the benefits of each one of those items, but to explain the main benefit, which is to put yourself in the mindset of a cyclist. So that when you put on your clothes, you put on your helmet, your gloves, your shoes, You're not going to go about the experience half acidly. Keep that resistance on. You know, five or six, little hill here. But there's also some very specific uh, comfort benefits to the gear. And back downhill, so take off all that resistance, you know, one out of ten, soft pedal. Parker Highway off to our right. It's not real scenic.
And we're gonna coast down this hill, but uh, let's just, just soft pedal through this entire ride. Keeping that heart rate in the low to mid 60s. And if you're jumping up into the 70s or 80s, then you're obviously doing your own thing, so. That's fine. <laughs> The next thing you do to get your head in the game is to uh, prepare for the workout. If your doctor has told you to get some exercise, then probably be a good person to ask, how much exercise? How hard can I go? How should I limit or restrain myself? restrict my heart rate. Find out what your maximum heart rate is from your doctor. And then plan your days and weeks accordingly. So keep a calendar of what you intend to do. How many minutes do you want to ride on what day? What type of ride do you want to do? How hard do you want to ride? Are you still just trying to get the bike legs going and you're doing the 30 minutes minimum per day of easy aerobic activity like what we're doing now? Or do you want to step it up a bit and add an anaerobic workout or an endurance event or maybe you're training for an event or even a race? So from week to week, plan out your uh, rides, plan out your workouts. If you're cross-training and doing another exercise or another activity, include that in your schedule. Keep your head in the game, and eventually the body will follow. Now, if you're just starting out, I wouldn't uh, go overboard and start uh, trying to really push up the efforts and kill myself. I also wouldn't be trying to do an hour a day. I would probably start with about a half an hour. But if you're having a good time, then go longer. Really the, the, the idea is here is that if you're not having fun, then you shouldn't be doing it or do it until you're not having fun. Keep each workout fresh, fun, different. Keep it dynamic. And don't do the same thing every day. So if cycling is a new sport to you, pace yourself three times a week. Do something different the rest of the time. Not only will you burn out mentally, but your body might start being a little uncomfortable. Pressure points, saddle sores, and that's no fun. So pick something for 30 minutes a day, five days a week, either be Riding your bike, taking a walk, going shopping, cleaning the house, <laughs> taking a swim, going on a hike, fixing something. And then while you're doing this, learn a little bit about your body. Learn about, uh, you know, what what is your heart rate? I, 
and that's how fast your heart is beating. What your max heart rate is, which is basically the fastest your heart can possibly go uh, in your current level of fitness and comfort. Maxes are funny things because they're dynamic. Your max heart rate will fluctuate over time. As you're exercising, you will probably increase your max if you're starting from scratch. Feel more comfortable to push that pain threshold up and drive that heart rate up a little bit higher. And all of a sudden where your heart rate monitor used to say 100%, now it's saying 105%. You're like, oh, gotta raise my heart rate or my max heart rate on my monitor. And max heart rates will also vary from activity to activity depending on the forces and demands that you put on your body. Cycling's max heart rate is lower than your max heart rate if you're sprinting on, or you're running and you're sprinting as hard as you can. You know, how do you find your maximum heart rate? I would uh, ask my doctor to find that. But basically your maximum heart rate is a heart rate that your body can't exceed or perhaps one that you shouldn't exceed. If you just had a heart surgery, then you, you probably don't want to be testing out your actual max heart rate. And then we'll talk a lot about heart rate zones. Zone 1, which is what we're in now. Zone 2, zone 3, zone 4. and zone five. And each zone is appropriately named. Zone one is when your heart rate is between 60 to 70 percent of max and these are just the norms. Zone one is typically considered a fat burn zone. And then zone two 70 to 80 percent of your maximum heart rate. It's typically called your aerobic zone. Zone three is 80 to 90 percent of max, which is considered to be your anaerobic zone. And zone four, did I say there was a zone five? Zone four is your red zone. 90 to 100 percent of your max. So when we're saying maintain zone one, you know, we're saying keep our heart rate between 60 to 70 percent. And then there's that gray line, gray zone between each one, each threshold. So 70 percent could be considered zone one or zone two. And then it even gets more gray when you get into the anaerobic zone because typically your anaerobic zone defines your anaerobic threshold or where your VO2 max is and that can vary from athlete to athlete. We're not going to go into that. And proficiency is a big factor to move to the next level in cycling. Getting good at the sport is required to some degree before you'll start seeing improvements. 
in your body, in your health. Basically, you, you can't lose weight skating until you learn how to skate. If you're just trying to stand up without falling down, you're not going to get much of a workout. So the more proficient, the more effective is your training, and the more demand that you can put on yourself. There are certain things that each cyclist will learn or go through in order to develop that proficiency. Or in order to be proficient, there are certain things that have to be done. And not just uh, getting in shape or I guess or you know, doing the sport, but there's a, a bike body interface. Be comfortable on your bike. The bike should fit bike should be professionally fit if you don't know how to do it yourself. That's a huge factor in developing proficiency. I see a lot of cyclists who are so low to the ground or to their pedals that their knees are hitting themselves in the chest. That won't take them too far. So bike comfort uh, can be accomplished through you know, proper fit and that uh, in my opinion is the most important thing to do when you first start riding. Whether you're on a spin bike or a, your own bike Make sure that that bike is fitting you, and uh, if you haven't had it professionally fit, or I would suggest going out and getting that done right away. Outside of that, uh, your clothing helps to provide comfort. Breathable materials allow for better uh, evaporation of sweat keeping you cool so you don't dehydrate. Uh, the shorts with the uh, chamois helps to prevent chafing and infection. Also provides compression to help improve circulation in your legs. Chafing can be a very problematic thing especially to a beginning cyclist and there are certain things that we can do to try to mediate that and again bike fit is the most important thing the shorts might be second uh, there's other ointments that you can apply cortisones or chamois butter chamois lubricants Uh, important is uh, personal hygiene, keeping the area clean. Proficiency includes learning how to deal with cramping or how to prevent it, which uh, can be done through either you know, learning how to regulate your effort or maintaining a proper diet. Cramping is uh, commonly caused by depletion in sodium and electrolytes. So you're sweating, you're drinking water, and you're still sweating, and a Eventually, you run out of sodium or salt. 
your electrolyte ba balance plummets and your and your body can't uh, absorb any more fluids. So water follows salt. So you need to make sure that you have the proper nutrition before your ride and during your ride. And also looking at the elements. Is it a hot day? What else should you bring? How long should you ride for? Proficiency is learning how to deal with the fatigue. Soreness. You know, take on a take on board a bottle of Tylenol. Proficiency is learning how to deal with hot and cold when it's hot outside. How do you regulate your efforts? How do you deal with replenishing fluids? Do you have the proper equipment on board? Have you learned to carry the proper equipment on board? And if it's cold out, you know, how do you stay warm? What kind of clothes do you need to wear? A lot of people, uh, cycling is kind of a sport about eh, trying to show how tough you are. And if it's cold out, you know, still showing up in short sleeve shirt and short tights <laughs> and freezing. body just can't operate when it gets cold. Well, proficiency is also uh, developing flexibility. Uh, stretching the hamstrings out before a ride and the quads. Hamstring inflexibility can make the ride very uncomfortable because if you think you're at the right height and you can't get that extension in your legs due to the due to your flexibility, then you start rocking over the saddle. That uh, facilitates chafing. So stretch out. You know, proficiency basically is understanding how to prepare for a bike ride, what to bring along with you. Uh, how far you're going to go and how you're going to get there. And can you do it? And last, uh, your proficiency is, is uh, being proficient is finding a mindset which helps to curb an anxiety or nervousness to boost confidence to know or to understand that you can finish the ride and then becoming a proficient cyclist means learning how to balance the bike and handle it In preparing for a ride, do you have enough water? Are you wearing the right clothes? Do you have an extra set of tubes? Do you, can you inflate the tubes? Do you have a pump? Uh, do you have a set of uh, tools? Your cell phone, your wallet. As you become more proficient, you can work on fitness challenges, improving endurance, improving
improving your strength, improving your anaerobic threshold, decreasing your body weight, and having a stronger, healthier heart. Proficiency also includes learning the rules of the road on your bike, learning hand signals, uh, learning how to ride with one hand or no hands, learning how to ride in traffic and being comfortable in traffic, how to ride in groups, and what type of etiquette is expected of you while in a group. and also finding uh, bike friendly roads and routes that you can go on and lastly learning how to be safe while riding and safety is one of those pet peeves of mine I see so many people doing so many things wrong be them cyclists or drivers and a lot of it just has to do with common sense not trying to showboat don't be impatient value your safety over your workout And the first question you should ask yourself is, should you go or shouldn't you go? A lot of times the conditions just warrant that you stay at home. It may be too hot or too cold. And don't necessarily need to tough out every ride. That's why we got these great videos. <laughs> There's a limit to how hot it should be, or how, you know, hyperthermia is horrible. Uh, safety. Inspect your bike before you go on a ride. Make sure you have air in your tires. Oil up the chain. Everything's connected. Look at your brakes adjust your brakes or make sure that they're effective there's not too much play between your brake and your rim uh, there's not too little play look at your bike before you go do a little walk around while on the road look for road debris keep your head up gravel sand glass potholes, uh, dealing with traffic, you can write an entire book about that. Basically, when in traffic, do as the cars do. Turning left, use the left turn lane. Uh, if you don't have a bike lane, you have to make one. Uh, stay about three to four feet, a meter from the edge of the road. Don't try to hug the white line or the shoulder so tightly that if you get forced off the road, you're going to crash. Or if you get forced to the right, you're going to crash. Now again, wear weather appropriate clothing. Uh, this And then uh, ride within your limits. If you're not ready for a century, you haven't trained for it, then don't do it. Stay at home. Get ready for the next century. Or if you're going to go on a ride where you don't have support 
and you're not sure if you're going to be able to tackle it, yeah, maybe don't. Look at the weather. You can actually train for the heat. Um, your body does acclimate to the heat over time, but this is something you have to be very careful with. If you're getting ready for the summer and you're training indoors, turn off the AC. Uh, don't put on the fan. You know, make minor changes to your training as the seasons change. Because, you know, going from season to season and uh, all of a sudden riding in a 90 degree heat after training indoors at 70 degrees, uh, you'll become hyperthermic, suffer heat exhaustion, dehydration, cramping, perhaps worse. You know, preventing dehydration, make sure you have enough water on board, making sure that you're regulating your water intake. So every 10 minutes, take a sip whether you feel thirsty or not on this nice gentle ride. More strenuous rides, you'll need to ramp that up every five minutes. Uh, you can dehydrate by sweating profusely drinking profusely and not replacing the electrolytes that you're sweating out. So bring along a replacement. Goos or gel packs are great. You'll eventually go through a bottle of uh, Gatorade or something like that so I don't use those except for maybe shorter one hour rides. If you go longer than an hour, that Gatorade gets hot and disgusting. <laughs> so I always carry a pack of uh, shot blocks and just pop one down every 15 minutes or so and keep that electrolyte balance up. You now hypothermia can come on pretty quickly especially if it's a cold day you're climbing up a steep hill you're sweating you're going slow you're taking on a ton of water and then all of a sudden you get to the top and you start your descent and you will freeze quickly shortness of breath numbing of fingers and toes you're going into hypothermia. And then uh, skin care. Ointments, lotions help prevent chafing. We're in the city of Cherry Creek. Or the Cherry Creek district of Denver, I should say. So why do say cyclists shave their legs? I've heard a lot of different <laughs> theories from people who don't know. Aerodynamics is my favorite. Uh, it's not that. It's about skin care. The first uh, most important thing, you go down on your bike, get a giant raspberry on your thigh, um, you're gonna have to shave that if that happens and cleaning out the 
pavement from your wound can be painful. Shave legs, just rinse it off with soap and water and throw a, uh, like some uh, blister wrap, I think is what they call it. And basically what it does is it's a, it's a sheet like a rubber sheet that adheses to your skin over your wound and you can leave it on for five days to a week and just let it blister and then change the dressing until the wound is healed. Removing a dressing like that with hair is not a pretty picture. <laughs> And then also the post-ride massage feels much better with shaved legs. <laughs> if you got somebody to rub your legs at night. That thing is noisy. So we just uh, got off Cherry Creek Trail there. We could continue to follow it all the way into downtown, but we're just taking a little detour here to Washington Park. I love how the just uh, maybe a thousand feet. I, mean, I think yeah, I think we just descended. Oh, 800 feet elevation difference between where we started to here. The trees are greener, green grass. It's warmer too. The last thing I want to talk about with proficiency is being uh, mechanically proficient, having knowledge of how to work on your bike is real important because nothing will end a ride faster than if something goes wrong with your bike and you can't fix it. So learning how to change your tires or tubes first thing you should learn and practice the one minute tire change it's not horribly difficult that's the first thing that goes wrong on a bike during a ride flat tire the next most common thing is uh, breaking your chain that'll have happen a lot So learn how to repair your chain. Get the right chain You're tool. Welcome. It's a messy job, but it's pretty easy to do. <laughs> when riding, a lot of times you might uh, hit something, your wheel, your tire, or maybe you have to come to a sliding, skidding stop and you have no more rubber on your tire. And as a result, you get a flat because your tube bladder popped out the hole and went flat. You put another tube in, you pump it up, same thing happens. So you need to learn how to fix that. Simple surgery 
if you have a dollar bill folded up cover the hole in your tire insert tube and inflate that'll get you home little things like that becoming a proficient cyclist uh, another thing that'll happen to me from time to time is a cleat malfunction losing a screw or a bolt on my cleat and you can't get you can't get out of your pedal because your foot just turns and your cleat doesn't go anywhere it's a little little freaky I pop the other foot out and then uh, take your shoe off your other foot and then try and pop your cleat out by whacking it or if you have the right tools you can pop a screw back in and fix your cleat so I'll carry a screwdriver an allen wrench a set of tire irons inflation kit And then every once in a while, maybe the bike will fail to shift properly. So understanding how to adjust the tension to your cables quickly. Sometimes you can do it while in the saddle. Other times you just need to hop out, get your Allen wrench and make the adjustment real quick by tightening the cable. So knowing how to do that on the road can be very beneficial. And becoming proficient means maybe saving a little bit of money, learning how to do your own tune-ups and overhauls. Welcome to Washington Park. it sucks not to be able to ride because your bike isn't working right and you don't know how to fix it and you don't have money to do it. So if you know how to work on your own bike, you can do a better job. Perhaps. <laughs> Take more care, more time. When you fall in love with the sport and you fall in love with your bike, you'll baby it. Give it all the loving it needs. <laughs> and you'll be rewarded by having a bike that'll last a long time. One that's safe and fun to ride. Speaking of being, being proficient, learning how to read the signs on the road is real helpful. And we are going in the flow of the walking traffic. No ride is complete without one little mistake. Give me a break. I'm like watching people going, why are the bikes going that way? <laughs> okay, here we go. And remember, keep in mind the words of Greg LeMond. It never gets easier, you just go faster.
Keeping that cadence right around 80. All right. Zone one. Not much to talk about. I've been at about 62% the whole way, with the exception of a couple of those little climbs. Real important to any training regimen, regardless of how hard you want to go, how fast you want to get, how strong a cyclist you want to be, whether you're a sprinter or a climber, Die-hard triathlete. The most valuable training time is recovery. See, I bet y'all didn't know Denver was this pretty, huh? I think you gotta go to the mountains for the view. Ah, oh, the mountains are awfully beautiful. During a zone one ride and recovering like this, we're staying aerobic burning fat and letting our muscles repair from the week's worth of damage that we've applied by killing ourselves. This is a uh, yeah, pretty much old town Denver. The streets are a little more narrow the houses are brick. The prices are high. <laughs> the trees are huge. Some just amazing nooks that you can uh, stop at. Coffee, lunch, brunch. stop here and stretch out your legs. I wanted to go down that list of all the things which basically continue contribute to being a proficient cyclist because at first glance you might not realize that there is so much involved in how much knowledge you acquire from cycling and over time And I think that there, there's always room for learning, room for growth. And being a good cyclist doesn't just mean that you gotta 
Nice light bike. Distance and how far you ride on that bike doesn't mean a whole lot. Time spent in the saddle. How you're organizing your workouts and measure measurable improvement. That's what impresses me. And what I really like to hear is when people write me and tell me how much uh, they've improved their ability to, to cycle and, and that they're outgrowing the videos <laughs> and that they want to take it to the next level and do some uh, epic rides over the summer, century ride, or or more. Uh, tour tour of Colorado, pretty epic ride. Or somebody who rides me and tells me that they've just dropped a bunch of weight and blood pressure has gone down and they found a love of the sport that couldn't make me happier this is a Cherry Creek Canal not much to look at but it gets us through downtown Denver and to our destination. Now this tr this part here, you go on a weekend, it's, it's like dodging bunnies, I don't know. I can't come up with an analogy, but it's so busy. You got the people who are going real slow, rollerblading, walking with the dogs, the kids, cyclists, joggers, by the time you get to the end you're and you come back home and you're laying in bed all you can think of is on your left on your left <laughs> nice flat little descent we're still taking it easy got a tailwind so we're moving along pretty good here Resistance is about a, eh, let's call it a three. Cadence around 80. Heart rate, yeah, rising up to about Having fun with the tailwind at her back, generating a little extra speed, working just a little bit harder for it. It's like uh, the Death Star <laughs> down here. on the way back I'm always late and it's uphill a thousand feet it's not you, over 25 miles it's hard to really see it but you feel it I'm gonna end the ride downtown at the uh, Platte River crossing stop off at the Starbucks grab ourselves something to drink anyway, I'm always late coming home so I have to really hustle
I like the uh, single track off to the right. <laughs> yeah, this is where I'd go on my mountain bike. <laughs> Keeping the speed up. Let's uh, raise the leg speed right around 90. See if we can get our heart rate right around 70%. And don't hit the joggers. And back up. Proficiency in understanding your body. Learning how to work with your heart rate so that you can incrementally raise it or lower it is a great skill to have and just learning your body for starters and that skill will follow you into racing When sometimes you can't really look at your heart rate monitor or really uh, adhere to it. <coughs> Sorry. Test. I think my battery is dying. So sometimes you can't uh, follow the advice of your heart rate monitor, but you can learn to conserve power. Learn how to trickle it out, regulate it. And the idea with any race is to come across the finish line with more, uh, sorry, with more, hello, test. Test. Hey, hey, we're back. So regulating that effort and crossing the finish line with more left than your competitors. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> we have arrived.
Cherry Creek on the right, and there's the confluence between it and Platte River. Straight ahead of us, that brick building. That's our destination. It's a Super REI and Starbucks. And straight ahead of us here, you can't really see it, but uh, there's the Six Flags, Eliches, the Aquarium, the Children's Museum, a lot of fun things to do here. To the left of the bridge here is where the kayakers take a little uh, practice. There's right, right under us, there's actually a guy in his boat right now. Straight ahead of us is the uh, trolley. There's a little fun little touristy ride. You can take it about um, two miles out and back along the Platte River Trail. And now the Cherry Creek Trail here is uh, going to end right at Platte River where we can continue north or we can back go back and go south all the way to South Denver and some other amazing parks and scenery and mountain rides. Go out to Deer Canyon or something, that's a, another great ride. Well thank you very much for listening to the narrative and staying with me. I really had a good time and hope to see you again later. This is BitBot signing out. Oh!